Okay, so I'll be honest. Um, I was going through this and Repro was definitely not my favorite. Um, you can only look at so much genitalia at one time. But um, we shall we shall, shall persevere through this uh, together. So we'll cover some of the anatomy, some of the clinical based anatomy first. Uh, that's of the anatomy stuff. That's going to be the most important, and then we'll get into the physiology. Um, and then, like I said, Lindsay will do the histology stuff at the end. So Keyshore is going to help me man the chat right now. Uh, so if y'all have any questions. He will, uh, obviously y'all can just um, chime in and uh, Kishore is gonna help too. All right, so like I said, the slides are posted on Scrubs. Oh, I should mention, we since it was su such a dense um, week or module, we decided not to do questions. It just took a really long time to get all this done. So um, no questions today, but if y'all come across questions that y'all find difficult, y'all can always message me and I'll take a look or Lindsay too. All right, and Lindsay's page, dog bomb. We put stuff in the additional resources, y'all know about that. So let's get started. Okay, like I said, I wanna just mostly point out the clinical stuff, the things that I felt um, were testable material. So the perineal body is, is uh, of utmost importance. It's an anchor point for all the muscles. So it, particularly during birth, when they do an episiotomy, whereas they, they make a, an incision here, um, a lateral incision, typically through the bul bulbospongiosis muscle, which you should know. Um, but the idea is that you don't want to rip into the perineal membrane because that it takes a long time to heal and it is an anchor point for those muscles that um, you want to keep intact by all means. So like I said, for the episiotomies, even nowadays, they actually don't, um, a lot of hospitals don't do episiotomies. They do this uh, sort of um, a technique or a maneuver when they're actually delivering the baby. So that um, that helps to prevent that. But if you have a large baby or macrosomia and the episiotomy is necessary, um, you want to make sure you do it on a, a lateral incision. Okay, and then remember that Kali's fascia is, uh, is continuous with scarpus fascia from the abdomen. So we'll see some of the clinical uh, applications with uh, some of the ruptures uh, of the membranes and, and how that works, but that'll come up in a little bit. I just wanted to introduce it here. The ischioanal fossa is important clinically because a lot of times this can uh, be a conduit for infections. So it's kind of uh, this fatty area in between um, the, um, the uh, near, near the anal canal uh, in between that and the vaginal uh, opening. Right, so these abscess can lead to tenderness uh, between the anus and ischial tuberosity, which uh, is here, right, the bone. Okay, now the important part here, again, this has to do with those, um, those, um, uh, with those injuries to the anterior urethra. But uh, you can see here that you have the, uh, the deep pouch and the superficial pouch. The most important thing right now is to remember that the perineal membrane is what separates them. So we'll see some clinical applications to that. Again, you could see that from scarpus fascia in the abdomen, Kali's fascia comes down, and you can also see Darto's fascia, which will go around the scrotum. Again, the perineal body is that anchor point. And uh, the perineal membrane and men as well separates the superficial and deep pouch. We'll see when we talk about the urethra, how it's separated, but that's gonna be a good clinical application too, because obviously, especially in a man, when you catheterize them, uh, you do have some uh, pinch points, particularly here at this junction where you make this, uh, this right turn or this, um, you know, this 90 degree turn, but we'll get there in a second. Okay. Uh, yeah, so um, I wanted to point this out specifically. Make sure you know what the limits are of the deep and the superficial pouch, right? So our, our landmark here is going to be um, the external urethral sphincter. That's going to be the most, uh, the closest to the blue line, right? But it's still technically in the deep pouch. Remember that the external urethral sphincter is going to be under somatic control, right? That's when you're really have to pee and you have to hold it, right? That's external, the external sphincter. The internal sphincter is under autonomic control. So just keep in mind for right now um, that the external sphincter is contained within the deep pouch. As you would expect in the superficial pouch, the, erect, the erectile tissue 
and uh, the skeletal muscle is, is all in the, in the superficial area, right? Okay, um, or distal to the, to the superficial pouch. Now the pelvic diaphragm, if y'all remember, I, I'm pretty sure y'all talked about this, but these muscles are super important to uh, prevent rectal incontinence, these pelvic floor muscles, the pubococcygeus and whatnot. And um, uh, this, this band pattern, sometimes they, they break up the pubococcygeus and this is puborectalis, this little band that goes directly around it. But either way, either one that they give you, um, super important for rectal continence. Now, I know you may say when we go through this that a lot of the anatomy was left off. Uh, unfortunately, most of it's just memorization. So again, I'm really trying to focus on the clinical applications here. Okay, so the pouch of Douglas, most underrated pouch in the body. Uh, it is the most dependent pouch for fluid buildup here, right? So it's, it's a very uh, uh, relevant test question. Um, so in the female, obviously men don't have it because they don't have a uterus, but it is the recto uterine pouch, right, between the rectum and the uterus. So if you're worried about some sort of intra-abdominal bleeding, the patient is standing, uh, this is where you would expect the fluid to build up, the most dependent or the lowest point for gra gravity-wise for the fluid to uh, build up. Now, what do you do in the case of this? Uh, you can actually do a caldocentesis. You can see that here. So you insert a needle and you aspirate it into the vaginal canal and you aspirate in between the uterus and the rectum. So a lot of times uh, in traumas, they can, they can do this quickly. They can do an ultrasound and check quickly to see if uh, there's any fluid there, which would again indicate possibly uh, uh, some sort of intra-abdominal bleeding. So just make sure you have this word uh, in your head with that. That's what that's for. Okay, what's important about this, this plexus? Well, what you find is that the prostatic plexus here, uh, it, it leads into the internal uh, venous plexus of Batson. Now, what's important about that is this is a valveless system. So a lot of times with prostate cancer, uh, you can get metastasis up through this valveless system, sometimes all the way up even into the brain, but along that pathway. So keep that in mind, that is a route for metastasis uh, from the prostatic venous plexus into the uh, internal venous plexus of Batson, all because it is a valveless system. Okay, lymphatic drainage, everybody's favorite. So you want to separate this uh, anatomically, uh, you know, from 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 top to bottom, right? So you we're, we're going to break it up into three parts: the uterine fundus, the top of the uterus, that includes the uh, ovaries and uterine tubes, tubes is going to go to the lumbar node, nodes. So when I think of ovaries, I kind of think male, not male equivalent, but you know, they're, they're kind of like the testes, right? So they're all going to go to the lumbar nodes, ovaries, testes, same thing. So I put those up there. Then the middle section, the body of the uterus, all the way to the cervix is going to uh, drain into the external and internal iliac nodes. The, the way the, the notes don't say directly, I think um, it, it, it goes internal, then external, but I think it's kind of like, uh, just know both for now, okay, to, be, to play it safe. And then the lower vagina, they say the lower one fourth of the vagina, of the vagina will drain into those superficial inguinals. When I see superficial inguinals, I, 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 I key in on superficial being obviously the more, uh, the more distal parts, right? The more superficial parts. So like the the distal part of the penis, the lower part of the vagina is gonna go superficially, right? Superficial inguinal, that should make sense. And then the male side, again, the testes, which are intra-abdominal in birth, they have to descend. So they're technically during birth considered an, an abdominal organ, which means that they're innov innervated and the blood supply comes from the abdomen. So that would make sense that they go to the lumbar nodes and easy enough, uh, everything, prostate, seminal vesicle, the vas deferens is gonna go to internal iliac, right? Okay, now you definitely want to know these, the autonomics. The way I remember it, it's pretty easy. Sacral splanchnics, S for sympathetic nervous system. Pelvic splanchnics are going to go for the parasympathetic nervous system. That's what you need to know there. Now remember, this is different from the pelvic pain, pain line. I know people get confused about this. This is just the autonomics, right? The autonomic system, what helps with urination and whatnot. So what we'll see is the pelvic pain line is different. So what the pelvic pain line is, remember the pain is, is, is um, transmitted to the brain through visceral afferent fire, right? So the pelvic pain line is telling you which 
where the autonomic or the visceral, I'm sorry, where the visceral afferent fibers travel. So above the pelvic pain line, these visceral afferents travel uh, with the sympathetics, with the sympathetic system. And right there, right about by the cervix, that you know, right about the lower end of the vagina, uh, of the uterus and uh, the, the little part of the cervix here, everything below that is gonna go with parasympathetics. So if they ask you, they could ask you a question that says, you know, where, you know, what is uh, causing the pain or what fibers cause pain in the uterine fundus? Don't, don't say sympathetic fibers. It's still visceral afferents. It's just saying, what track do the visceral afferent fibers travel with? So above the pelvic pain line, these fibers will go, to, go up to the brain with or up through the body with the sympathetic and below there, those visceral afferent fibers will travel with um, the pelvic uh, splanchnics, right? Okay, so just keep that in mind and you should be fine. Um, and then of course, when we talk about the more distal or the more superficial area, again, it's under uh, somatic control. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much about this sympathetic innervation, but I just wanted to point out the motor and sensory innervation is, is through the puten pudendal nerve, which is a somatic innervation, right? So you think when you think of like the, ex um, the external urethral sphincter or the external anal sphincter, right? You can hold that under, under uh, um, um, somatic control, you know, voluntarily. So that's all going to be somatic when you think of voluntary uh, control. Okay, um, yeah, so I wanted to point this out. So when you think about the superficial, again, we're saying superficial, the most superficial area is gonna go to the superficial inguinal nodes. The, the exception is the erectile tissue because you might consider, especially in a man, uh, that, or, well, either way, that the erectile tissue is going to be, um, uh, to go to, it is superficial, so wouldn't it travel with the superficial inguinal? Well, no, anything that's classified as erectile tissue is going to go to the deep inguinal nodes, okay? So even though they may actually be superficial, just make sure you have to distinguish whether it's erectile tissue, uh, tissue or, you know, just the skin. And again, it should be noted that they actually go to the horizontal group, just in case they ask. Okay, uh, I'm not sure we had a question on this, but it is a clinically relevant. So, you know, if you sit down on your butt too long, you kind of get numb. Uh, you, this can actually get a lot worse than, you know, your typical studying all day, but um, you can actually lose a lot of um, sensation or, or, or the, that feeling of innervation um, through the pudendal canal, a lot of swelling in that area, and um, it could pinch the nerve and you can end up with rectal incontinence, uh, sexual impotence. But again, this is very extreme. Okay, um, right, so I wanted to point out here uh, when we, so um, the vas deferens or ductus deferens, you can use that interchangeably, but it's gonna carry the sperm from the testes all the way up through the inguinal canal and over to the seminal vesicle, okay? So uh, I think I have some, um, some scans to look at, so we'll look at that, at least in the female, but uh, that's an important point. You wanna make sure you know that that actually goes in Transver traverses through the inguinal canal. And again, um, nothing too relevant here. You can appreciate how large the prostate is. So we have the prostatic urethra here. The membranous urethra is right about here. And then we'll get into the rest in a little bit. But the, the point I wanted to, to point out here is that that vas deferens is actually going to come from the testes, go through the inguinal canal around your hip, and then back to the um, in behind the prostate or right around the prostate, but behind the bladder to the seminal vesicle where this, the sperm can, and the semen can kind of mix. Now, what is the equivalent of the pouch of Douglas or the rectouterine pouch in a man? It's the rectovesicular pouch, vesicular implying the bladder, right? So the rectum and the bladder. So that would be the most dependent place for fluid accumulation if the man was standing up. Okay, um, now we, I did mention that the testes have to descend, right? So the point being here is that a lot of the, inner, well, the innervation and the blood supply is gonna come from the abdomen. So this testicular artery has to come down. The ureter obviously is gonna come down to the bladder. But if for the men, if you're ever wondering why your left testicle hangs slightly lower than your right testicle, that's because on the left side, the left testicular vein 
goes down to the left testicle and um, it, it comes directly off the left renal vein. So easy to remember that. Whereas on the right side, that left renal vein is gonna go directly into the inferior vena cava. So that's, that's something that it's like a light bulb to me, totally testable, right? That's one of those variations against symmetry, right? So why does it do that? Well, because God decided, I guess, I'm not exactly sure, but just keep in mind on that left side, the left testicular vein is gonna drain into, uh, into the left renal vein. So if they could ask you some sort of question, they could say, um, if you had some sort of metastasis from the right renal vein, where is it gonna, where, where's the next place it's gonna go? So that would be the inferior vena cava, whereas on the left side, left renal vein. So keep that in mind. Okay. Um, right, again, we can see that the, the vas deferens or the ductus deferens goes back to the seminal vesicle um, through the inguinal canal. And then this is if we're looking at the back side of the bladder, so the, the most posterior side, you can see the seminal vesicle and the prostate. And so the vas deferens is gonna come up right here, um, right here to this one. And then it's gonna store here and then go um, around the prostate uh, right here. And then there's the ejaculatory duct here from the seminal vesicle. I think, oh, here it is, perfect. So this was on our lab exam. Right, so you could see here. I think what they actually did, they 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 um, they got a catheter, a tiny catheter, into the ejaculatory duct right here, and they shot dye up in it. So you could see the dye in the seminal vesicle. You could see the dye all the way to the vas deferens, and then you could see it collecting down in the testicle. So I think that's what they were doing, maybe to try to see if the patency of the of the uh, of the vast deference, but you can appreciate that out here. So if you wanted to orient yourself that they just gave you a picture, you could see that the patient is straight on, right? Because you see the hips, right? Um, and then you could see this because, uh, right? So we're looking straight on. You could see the symmetry, the left, the right. So it's not a lateral picture, we're looking straight on. Okay, prostate, a lot of y'all read about this, you know, in, in older men said the prostate, um, you can get benign prostatic hyper, uh, hyper, hyper Hyperplasia. Which one is it? Hyperplasia. Hyperplasia. I think back in the day it, they used to call it hypertrophy and they changed it. Um, but yeah, it's hyperplasia. Yeah, I think so. Um, or maybe it's just maybe it's just I have that wrong. Hyperplasia, right? So increased cell count. So uh, you could check a prostate specific antigen or PSA for that. Um, but yeah, so uh, you could appreciate how large that is. Um, I think that's all I wanted to point out here. We'll get into the clinical stuff in a little bit. Okay, and then if we look at the uh, urethrogram here, so they shot dye into the urethra. Oh, this is what I wanted to point out, yeah. So um, I use this picture coming up again. Okay, so we wanna separate the urethra into the anterior and posterior parts. So the membranous urethra and prostatic urethra is gonna be considered the posterior part. And that is that 90 degree bend we talk about. And then you have the bulbous portion and the penile portion. So because of the anatomical location, this membranous urethra often uh, uh, gets severed when you have an injury down here. So that's problematic, but um, you can appreciate here, if they gave you this, um, you, can, you can distinguish what is what. So right, the bulbous part is more of this larger area this bend and right after that bend is the membranous. And then this sort of swelling right here is the prostatic urethra. And then, yeah, so I just wanted to do this. Uh, uh, obviously this is flipped, but you could see the same thing. You see this bend right here correlates to this bend right here, this membranous urethra. Okay, now this is super important. Um, keep them separate because the lobes and the zones don't exactly correlate. So if you see, you may think, well, let's just say it correctly. So the median lobe, is down here. So the transitional zone, it doesn't correlate to this. The transitional zone is on the anterior side. It's on the top part. So if you're gonna learn something, I would definitely focus on the zones because they use the zones diagnostically. And you'll see that here. So when you get this hyperplasia, you can see it primarily, I put a star here, so I should definitely know this. You'll find this in the transitional and periurethral zone. So very centralized with this BPH, which makes sense because they have problems urinating, right? If you have this swelling right around the urethra, whereas prostate cancer is located in the peripheral zone. So that's why you do a DRE, a digital rectal exam. And they, they use the term boggy, which is a funny word to me, but it means it's kind of like squishy, 
right? So you want um, you you want the prostate to feel a little a little squishy, um, but um, uh, if it's hard, if it's nodular, then you may think uh, prostate. But you'll note you can notice that in the peripheral zone, right? So this is why they typically do a DRE. Okay, so keep these in keep these separate in your head. But um, by all means, don't get the, the the zones and the the lobes confused. The zones are more important for you guys and for clinical. Um, analysis. Okay, for this guy, I think they actually made him drink fluid. So they, they made him probably drink a liter or two, maybe a liter of fluid, and then wait about 30 minutes or an hour. And then so you could see his bladders all lit up. But again, you could appreciate the prostate here, right here. This is an MRI, a lateral MRI. You can see the, uh, the um, vertebrae here, uh, the rectum here, it's, um, and then the prostate here. And then you could see the, the penis here and the urethra going uh, through here, right? Okay, now again, I just wanna mention this again, we're worried about prostate cancer spreading through the internal venous plexus of Batson. It can, like I said, it can go all the way up and um, metastasize to the brain, all because of this valveless system. Keep this in mind, it's valveless. Okay, so the corpus cavernosum is gonna be what fills with blood and that uh, uh, elicits an erection. So um, I think that's, all. I just wanted to point out, yeah, the, the cavernosus and then the spongiosis here. Um, uh, I wish Lindsay was here, I wanted to ask her. There was a question on our test that uh, the answer was deep dorsal vein. I got it wrong. I don't remember the question though, but the answer was deep dorsal vein. I don't know what it had to do, but it, this is this is a good point I want to bring up. If, Kishore, if you remember when Lindsay gets here, um, remind me to ask her. Um, but you, make sure you understand that uh, the anat anatomically the 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 underside of the penis is considered the ventral side. So uh, if I had to guess, I would say a man is is the guy that made the anatomical positions because. Um, the, the, the erect side, you know, the penis has to be erect because um, <laughs> the ventral side correlates to, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the bottom side correlates to the ventral side. So keep that in mind. Um, and like I said, the deep dorsal vein is gonna be on the dorsal side. So what you would consider the top side, but if you're erect, it's on the back side, right? So just keep your anatomy uh, in order because they could ask you that on the test. Um, okay, so super important. So there's two types of anterior urethral injuries. And the, the clinical aspects you wanna ask yourself is, is there injury to box fascia, okay? Because if there's no injury, then um, it's gonna be limited to the, the injury is gonna be limited to the penis. So you can see that here. So urine and sometimes blood can leak out into, into the, but it's gonna be limited here because Buck's fascia hasn't been um, hasn't been torn. Now the opposite is if you do tear uh, Buck's fascia. So you could see this this butterfly. This was what they call this butterfly shape. So um, extravation, extravation, which means that the urine has been able to um, get out of where it should have been in in the urethra. So you can see here that you get this. So this, if they ever say. Uh, somebody comes in and they have extravation, extravation of blood or urine up into the abdominal cavity and it's making some sort of butterfly uh, um, um, patterning or extravation. Um, you want to say that you definitely had injury to Buck's fascia. That's going to be the clinical, um, clinical uh, correlate here and it'll extend into the superficial perennial pouches, right? That would indicate that Buck's fascia was injured. Okay, the, uh, the third type or so, so we have anterior injury, not including Buck's fascia, anterior including Buck's fascia, and then you can actually get a posterior urethral tear. So the buzzword for this is you're gonna say a high riding prostate. These are typically saddle injuries, like riding on a horse or whatnot. And if you tear the posterior aspect, you'll end up with a high riding prostate, which means the prostate kind of shoots up because it's torn. So it has nothing to kind of hold it back down. Okay. Um, Everybody knows the mnemonic now. Point uh, for an erection is parasympathetics and shoot is for semetics. So keep that in mind for the autonomic system. Now let's get into the female. Um, some important things here. Okay, so the proper ovarian ligament is gonna connect the ovary 
to the uterus, okay? But the ovarian arteries are gonna come through the suspensory ligament, okay? What you'll find is the, the, um, the uterine arteries are gonna come through this cardinal ligament that comes across here. But keep in mind that the suspensory ligament is what's gonna uh, attach or, or bring the uterine artery and vein to the, oh, I'm sorry, the ovarian artery and vein to the ovary. So obviously what happens, the follicle ruptures, it kind of floats in the abdominal cavity, the fimbriae pick it up in the fallopian tube, and then the sperm comes through the uterus, and then they meet right around the ampulla, and that's where fertilization happens. Um, okay, now very important is that most oftentimes that ampulla is where the fertilization happens. So ideally the egg comes up here, the sperm comes through here, they meet, and then they both migrate back down into the uterus where you get implantation. That's the ideal situation. A lot of times with ectopic pregnancies, you wanna remember that the ampulla is the most common site for ectopic pregnancies. Pelvic inflammatory disease is uh, and often, often a cause, you can get mucus buildup or whatnot from the PID, and that'll cause the uh, fertilized egg to not be able to get back down to the uterus. Okay, so just some more clinical applications for you. Um, keep this in mind. If you keep, if you remember the normal stuff, then you can you can figure out abnormal. So remember the normal positioning of the uterus. It's antiverted from the vagina to the to the cervix. Just means turned forward, and then it's anti-flexed, right? So it's kind of like it's it's bent forward here. So just remember that it's anti-verted, anti-flexed, and uh, that's the normal positioning. So anything that they would give you other than that would make mean it's abnormal. But this is how it should be. Again, you can see the pouch of Douglas here, that dependent place where if the patient is standing where blood would collect. Um, okay, uh, HPV was brought up. This was more of a problem uh, a few years back, but with the vaccine now, this is becoming less prevalent. But when you do a pap smear, they use a brush and kind of uh, brush off some cells from the cervical os, and then they can analyze those. This is a very slow growing tumor, but you wanna pick up this dysplastic change or these changes quickly so you can address it accordingly. But again, with the vaccine out now and children are advised to get it, or parents are advised to get it for their children at 12 or 13, uh, ideally prior to uh, them starting to start to having sex, uh, then um, they'll be fine in that regard. Okay, so the broad ligament uh, is gonna cover three areas. The mesometrium, metrium meaning uterus, uh, meso-ovarium obviously mean ov ovary, and then the meso-salpingus, salpingus, salping, salping, which means the, uh, the fallopian tube, right? So this is all gonna be this broad ligament. Uh, it's kind of draped over and it contains everything. Can't really appreciate that cardinal uh, ligament that comes across, but I have another picture for it. Um, and again, the suspensory ligament is going to hold those, uh, those ovarian vessels. But, okay, this is important, uh, primarily during a hysterectomy. Y'all have heard this mnemonic, the water, or not this, this, uh, this catchphrase to try to remember it, it's water under the bridge, right? So what they're saying is the the, ov um, the uterine vessels, which go into the cardinal ligament um, or the transverse cer cervical lig ligament, they're, they're, um, they're interchangeable. Transverse cervical is the cardinal ligament. So it's water under the bridge. So the uterine artery and vein is the bridge and the ureter is the water. So why is this important? Well, if it's in surgery, when you do a hysterectomy, you have to cut these ligaments, right? So you, and, and obviously you wanna sever or, or uh, ligate the um, uterine artery and vein, but you certainly don't wanna go too deep. So you wanna cut the bridge, but you don't wanna touch the water, right? You don't wanna cut the ureter. So that's important clinically because um, obviously during surgery, it's not color coded for you. Um, so keep that in mind, that'll help you remember it. Okay, fundal height. Um, it's uh, obviously to, to distinguish how large the baby is, or if there's some sort of fluid discrepancy, right? Poly or oligohydramnios. But just know that you want to measure from the top of the uterus to the top of the pubic bone. So that's a good standard, um, standard measurement. 
the blood supply to the uterus and uh, the pelvic organs, um, it's densely, it has dense anastomoses. So you'll see that a lot of the blood supply comes from the abdomen and a lot comes from the pelvis too. So they kind of anastomose in the middle. So um, the ovarian artery and vein uh, uh, comes down. So it, it originates from the abdominal aorta. Uh, again, the ovarian artery and vein is gonna be maintained in the suspensory ligament. I, I keep bringing this up because it, there was a really confusing picture on our lab, lab exam that we, we had to try to figure out, you know, where the fallopian tube was and which one, where the ovarian artery and vein and the suspensory ligament. But um, you were able to tell where the suspensory ligament was containing the ovarian artery and vein, artery and vein because you could appreciate the large ovary there. So, I mean, it, it's uh, obviously testable. I mentioned that the uterine artery and vein is uh, within the transverse cervical or the cardinal ligament. So it's gonna come through here. And then you also get um, blood supply from the pelvic area originating from the internal iliac artery. So in, it's gonna come through here. So the abdo abdominal supply and the pelvic supply is gonna anastomose through here. Okay, and uh, important clinically, this will provide a channel for metastasis, okay? Ectopic pregnancies, I mentioned that most common site for ectopic pregnancies is gonna be in the ampulla of the fallopian tube and pelvic inflammatory disease is often a risk factor for that. Um, okay, I mentioned this as well. Remember the idea of the, the, uh, the episiotomy here is to cut through the bulbal spongiest mus muscle, uh, a lateral cut so that you don't tear the perineal body. Again, this is an anchor point and you, uh, it does take a long time to heal. So you wanna avoid um, tearing that area. Okay, pelvic pain line, very sim well, it's similar, pretty much the same in, in male and females. Above it, it's gonna go, the visceral afferents are gonna travel with the sympathetics. Below it, the visceral afferents are gonna travel with the parasympathetics. Remember the pain fibers are still visceral afferent fibers. They just travel with the autonomics, okay? <clears throat> Mention this, so when you get pelvic inflammatory disease, often referred to as PID, uh, you can get mucus buildup here. I could actually get all the way into the abdominal cavity, but it does cause uh, problems if you fertilize the egg and it's trying to come back or it's trying to get to the uterus. <clears throat> if you had, and um, you can get um, an ectopic pregnancy there. Okay, so this was also on our lab exam or something very similar. So you wanna orient yourself. So are we looking at laterally or are we looking uh, straight on? So this is, uh, this is a hysterosalpingogram. So they, they put a tube up by the cervix and they shot dye into the uterus. So you can appreciate the symmetry here, right? If we cut down the middle, so it looks like it is uh, a straight on view, an anterior posterior view, and you can see um, part of the, uh, the pelvis here as well. So if we're looking straight on, you would expect uh, the uterus and then the fallopian tubes coming off. Okay, um, let's see here, same thing, right? So that's right at the cervical os and they shot some dye up. So what's the problem here, right? Why do we see, we're looking for symmetry, always looking for symmetry. Well, you can appreciate the fallopian tube here, right? You can't see it over here. So likely there's some sort of blockage on the right side. Okay, everybody's favorite, the uterine prolapse. So the problem here is that um, <laughs> the, uh, the ligaments get lax, right? And um, unfortunately, the uterine is able to prolapse. This is this, so it has to be repaired surgically. The, um, uh, but this is actually, I wanted to mention, this is actually the same way they do a hysterectomy. So they, they cut those ligaments and uh, they're able to remove the uterus through the vagina. All right, male reproduction. So we'll get into some of the physiology here too. So remember from the testes, uh, the sperm in the seminiferous tubule is gonna go to the reet testes and then through the epididymis, right? And it's gonna go up through the vas deferens through the, um, 
uh, all the way to the seminal vesicle, right, through the inguinal canal. And as the sperm goes, it kind of picks up, it kind of picks up semen. So some of the important things uh, in the prostate, it'll add alkalin alkalinization. This is important for the sperm because um, the vaginal can canal can um, be acidic. So this will allow the sperm to uh, survive in that environment. So seminal vesicle will add some fructose, just sort of energy for the sperm. So it's, it is important to kind of know this breakdown and how it works. Okay, I don't like this picture at all, um, but it does illustrate that from the Leydig cells where you're gonna be making testosterone, uh, you do have uh, this tight junction is that blood testes barrier. So this is the development of the sperm. Finally, the spermatozoan, which is gonna be a haploid sperm, one in, right? So the idea is that when it combines with the egg, it'll be two in, right? Again, it'll be uh, its normal configuration, getting half chromosomes from mom, half from dad. I put this in since that picture was so bad. This is from first aid, so you can kind of break it down. So this is your typical meiosis, meiosis one, you're gonna split in half. Meiosis two, you're gonna split the sister chromatids and um, you'll have four here. Uh, again, it'll combine with the egg and it'll again be 46 or, or two chromosomes. Um, two copies of each chromosome. And this is more important when Lindsay comes on and she does the histology stuff, um, you, but you wanna appreciate that the Leydig cells is outside of this cellular compartment with the with the, where the sperm is being developed. So they, they did give us a picture, a histology picture kind of pointing here and just asking a second order question and saying, uh, just pointing to this cell on the outside and saying, well, what, what pituitary hormone works there? So that would obviously be LH. Okay, this is again from uh, first aid, but it kind of explains the development. So the idea is that um, the testes uh, through the Sertoli cells actually secrete malarian inhibitory factor. So it's gonna tell, um, tell the male to, not, to, to, um, to inhibit the paramesonephric ducts so that you're not gonna get female development here. So that's the goal. The default pathway is to, be, to, be, to become a female. So you use this malarian inhibitory factor and uh, the paramesonephric duct will be inhibited so that you can actually have testosterone formation. 5-alpha reductase makes the more potent form DHT and this will allow for um, male characteristics, both, both primary and secondary male characteristics uh, to develop. Now it's very important that GnRH is pulsatile secretion. So if for whatever reason, if it's a tumor formation or some sort of medication that's that would cause a uh, constant secretion of GnRH, that's a way of physio physiologically castrating the man. It has to be received in this pulsatile fashion. Okay, so that's a route for medication um, for whatever reason, if, if you need to do that. This was from the notes as well. So remember the LH receptor is gonna activate the GS, uh, secondary messenger system, which has adenylyl cyclase, PKA, protein kinase A, enzymes, the cholesterol is gonna make those, uh, those precursors, remember androstenedione. dione. And again, the whole goal here is to increase testosterone. Then it could come across to the Sertoli cells where you could see FSH is working. Again, it uses the same uh, GS pathway, and this is where uh, the, the sperm can uh, develop. Now, most of this is pretty self-explanatory, but again, accessory organs, testicular descent is very important. Testosterone is important for that. So if you have some sort of um, a deficiency in testosterone or feminization, a lot of times the, test the, the testes will not descend. You can get cryptorchidism and they won't descend all the way into the, to the scrotum. So the important things you need to remember are the reproductive stuff, which is pretty straightforward, right? Development of secondary characteristics, sexual characteristics, increasing the size of the penis and reproductive organs. Uh, the hematocrit does go up. I'm not, I'm not really sure if that's very important right now, but one of the clinical things, it does promote long bone fusion. So a lot of time when, when people have a problem with testosterone, you would think they would be, their, their height would be stunted, but actually what happens, they're, they're referred to as eunuchs. They actually have increased height. 
their bones are actually brittle. They're not as strong, but the epiphyseal or, um, or the epiphyseal plate or the growth plate does not close all the way. So they actually end up being taller than expected. So keep that in mind. That happens in both males and females. Okay, so typically testosterone is gonna be uh, bound to uh, the sex hormone binding globulin, SHBG. And that means it's inactive. Remember, if it's, if it's bound in circulation, it's inactive. You definitely wanna keep in mind that 5-alpha reductase is that important enzyme that's going to make a DHT, right? The more potent form of testosterone. This is from, uh, this is, is this the same one? This looks very similar to the, uh, um, to the other slide I had. Uh, yeah, okay. So yeah, the secondary, the sexual differentiation, again, uh, it illustrates it in diagram format, the development. Remember that SRY gene is, is on the Y chromosome. That's basically what tells the body to make a female. There's no SRY, the default pathway is to go uh, the female route. Okay, so we can see here GNRH, um, LA from the anterior pituitary, so GNRH from the hypothalamus will stimulate the anterior pituitary to make LH and FSH, L for Leydig, S for Sertoli. The thing that's important to point out here is inhibin. Inhibin will be made by the Sertoli cells and it will feed back on the anterior pituitary. So if inhibin is secreted, then uh, you're gonna get a decrease uh, LH and FSH. It's inhibin, it's inhibitory, okay? Let's see. Now, for an erection, the, the point part of the point and shoot is that the is parasympathetic. So what we're thinking is you need to uh, secrete or uh, um, nitrous oxide. Remember, nitrous oxide is a vasodilator. So if you vasodilate uh, the vessels around the penis, you'll allow to get an erection. You'll allow blood to flow into the penis. So that's what you want to keep in mind. Some of these medications that they use work very similarly, Viagra, Cialis, Levitra. So it's the same concept is that you can actually increase the CGMP. Remember nitrous oxide does that CGMP pathway, the G, right? That's for nitrous oxide. Um, it's very similar to the GS and the GQ pathway. It just kind of, it's like its own subset. So it'll inhibit CGMP degradation which will allow increased nitrous oxide, which will allow this vasodilation. Let's go into some of the different um, disorders. So hypogonadism, the main thing I wanted to point out here is that they are gonna be taller, right? You would expect them to be taller. Uh, this is obviously uh, prior to the growth plates being fused, okay? That this hypogonadism. So these bones are less strong, but the growth plates don't fuse. So you would expect them to be taller, again, pre-puberty. Now, post-puberty, these are the, what you would expect. You know, you would get decreased size of the sexual organs. Uh, um, the pitch might go up, so it, it, the voice in it isn't as deep. And then uh, loss of libido. Um, ej ejaculation rarely occurs. So that's more prototypical of what you would think. This is not um, talked about long. I seem to remember having a question on it. I'm not 100% sure. So just keep this in mind. Adiposogenital syndrome, adipose meaning fat, genitals meaning genitals, right? So it's actually a problem with GNRH in the hypothalamus. Now, as it is, this actually is close enough to uh, affecting the feeding center as well. So keep in mind adipose and genital, two separate things going on. Adipose, you get obesity because of the feeding center and hypogonadism as well. So make sure you keep that in mind for clinical aspect. I wanted to put this in here because the counts are important. So you wanna have about 120 million uh, sperm per milliliter. Anything below 20 million is considered infertile. So there's obviously a gradual gradient, but 120 is gonna be your marker for, for uh, good health. Okay, let's take a, a little break. I'll uh, answer some of the questions. Um, if y'all have any, let's say five minutes. Let's get on to the female stuff. All right, took this from first aid. I thought this was, uh, 
a nice relevant picture for you to look at. So ideally, and we'll get into Dr. Mandolini stuff where the receptors switch, but let's talk about this, uh, this normal thing right now. So the theca cell is gonna have receptors for LH and then um, it's gonna form androstene dione, right? Which is our precursor. And then it, the androstene dione is gonna go to the granulosa cell. That's where the FSH works. And it's gonna convert androstene dione to uh, the estrogen precursors or the, you know, the variants of estrogen, primarily estradiol. Uh, and aromatase is the enzyme. What is, what is the other name for this? I told y'all to remember. 19. 19, CYP19. Yeah, so they could use that interchangeably on the test. So make sure you know that. So this is in the normal format. This is what we've learned. And then Dr. Mandolini went on some rampage about the receptor switching. But I, I put a star on that slide to make sure we talk about it. Um, and this is what we were saying. So in the, the early to mid follicular phase, um, you would expect the granulosa cell, just like the previous pic picture, only has FSH receptors. But for whatever reason, in this late follicular phase, um, these, they're actually, it, it, it has LH receptors at that point. So the granulosa cell can take the cholesterol directly, make androstene dione to estradiol uh, directly. Um, I have a better picture of it coming up. So let's break this down. So um, we're looking here at the follicular phase too. I like the first aid picture coming up, but um, the point, so let's just do this first. Remember that the luteal phase is what's considered standardized. It's relatively constant. It's gonna be about 14 days. The normal cycle is 28 days, um, but it can vary. But the variance, if there is a variance, is gonna be in the follicular phase. Typically the luteal phase is standardized. Okay, so um, estradiol is the major major um, uh, format of estrogen, but, um, and that's the important part here. So it's, it's estradiol is the most potent in estrone than estriol. So again, just like testosterone, it's, it's bound in circulation by this sex hormone binding globulin which makes it inactive. It has to be a free in the free form to be active. And then these are what you would expect. Um, same, you know, the same stuff for the man, you know, you know, increased size of reproductive organs, excuse me, um, prepare the endometrium. And uh, the one thing that we wanna talk about, again, similar to testosterone, right? This is super important, this fusion, right? So when you have hypo, uh, gonadism or decreased testosterone, that's when you get the eunuchs, right? They're taller because their bones are brittle, but they won't, the, the, the plate won't close. So same thing here. So if a girl has some sort of estrogen deficiency, they'll be taller, but their, but their bones will, will, will be weaker. So it plays a part in this fusion. Everything else is pretty much what you've learned, you know, self-explanatory. Now, Progestins, mainly progesterone, is also important. So you see that uh, that that secondary spike. So um, the follicular phase has the estrogen, and then as it do dips down, then you have the uh, the luteal phase with progesterone. Luteal referring to the corpus luteum, which is going to be what makes the progesterone. But when we get into the pregnancy stuff, we will discuss that. So. Right, and, and this is important to prepare the uterus for implantation, right? This is after that LH surge when um, the, uh, the uterus is ready for uh, potential pregnancy. Okay, so this is what we were talking about. Um, I had it marked in my slides because Dr. Mandolinini, he, he, he talked about this for a long time and we did end up having a test question about it. So when we talk about the follicular phase, right, in the beginning, uh, the estrogen phase often called, you would expect the LH receptor to be on the theca cells. We're gonna take cholesterol, uh, form androstene dione, and then it's gonna be uh, transferred to the granulosa cell. This is where we have the FSH receptors. Again, both of these use the GS pathway, right? The CAMP pathway. And then from there, you could take the androstene dione and make estradiol sending it into circulation. Now, this is where it switches over. Um, now we're in the luteal phase, the progesterone phase, right? 
Uh, now, the granulosa cell now has this LH receptor. See, previously it doesn't, right? LH is limited to the theca cell. So the theca cells are required, right? We have to get the androstene dione to get to the granulosa cell. Now, at this luteal phase, um, for all intents and purposes, the granulosa cell can, can do it on its own, right? It gets the LH in, it could take the androstene dione, and from the cholesterol, it can make uh, estradiol along with the progesterone that it's going to need um, to keep the from the corpus luteum to uh, keep the uh, or yeah right so from the corpus luteum. So just keep that in mind that the luteal phase is where this LH receptor is added to the granulosa cell, making estradiol on its own, right? Okay. Brady, a question. Sorry to interrupt. Yes, sure, um, no problem. Um, for the granulosa cells, I just want to confirm something. So they now express LH receptors. So do they just do they only express LH receptors at this point, or are they also expressing FSH ones? No, it will express FSH. It always expresses FSH. Okay. It's just it's just um, now it's. Um, I don't know if you really talked about what the importance of doing this. I mean, it seems like it would work using both cell pathways, but. Um, it's just important for testing purposes to remember that uh, at this point, the granulosa cell, but yes, it does, it will express the FSH receptor as well. Yeah. Okay, sounds good, thank you. I have a question, Brady. Yep. Yeah, so for the follicular uh, phase, the main uh, hormone that is produced is estrogen, right? Correct, yes. Okay. But then yeah, FSH so will active or something? I get uh, let, give me a second. When we get to the first aid diagram, I'm going to break it down. Okay. And then if you have a question, then ask. Okay, thanks. Um, I like first aid kind of breaks it down like in different body systems. It makes it easier to, to break it down. Okay, um, so remember estrogen typically is going to have negative feedback, right? To the, to the, uh, and, um, to the pituitary and hypothalamus. Um, but this is an important point to make. It does switch to positive feedback. It's gonna help at that point to, at the LH surge, it's gonna have a positive effect on LH to initiate that LH surge to help the, uh, the, the follicle rupture, right? That's, that uh, indicates ovulation, okay? So it's coming up in a second. Um, I just wanted to break this down. This is from first aid as well. It's the same principle, um, except you don't get four haploid sperm, you get three polar bodies, right? And you get the, the sister chromatids here, but obviously the sperm would combine with this, the egg would be fertilized and it would be 46 again. So you could just, uh, this just helps me break it down. Um, you know, first aid does a good job at doing that. But remember, yeah, the ovum, once it's actually formed fully, is gonna be one in, indicating that there's one chromosome, one sister chromatid. Okay, uh, this is from your from the notes, but uh, first aid has it a little bit better. Let's see if we can get to it. Okay, yeah, this is it, right? So let's break it down from the different body parts. So from the hypothalamus, we're gonna get GNRH, we're gonna to go to the anterior pituitary, FSH and LH. FSH is at its highest point, Remember follicle stimulating, right? In that developing follicle phase, you do get a slight estrogen bump here. Not super relevant though. So FSH is higher, highest in the beginning of the cycle, okay? The first few days. Now, um, after that, you're going to get, we can go down to the ovarian phase and you're gonna get that, that sharp rise in estrogen. Right about this point, is where estrogen uh, switches from a negative feedback to a positive feedback. Though. And you can see that here because if it's positively feeding back, that's when you get this huge LH spike and that's what causes ovulation. So it's at this point that the follicle ruptures, that egg is floating in the abdominal cavity, the fallopian tube grabs onto it and it's ready for implantation. Now, after this, the body assumes there's possible pregnancy, right? So you're forming this corpus luteum and we can go down to the endometrium here. So progesterone is coming is coming from this the corpus luteum and it's helping uh, develop the endometrium for possible implantation. Now the corpus luteum for this phase, making that progesterone, you see this progesterone spike, 
coming from the corpus luteum, this purple line, that's what's allowing the endometrium to, to grow like this. Uh, now, the beta HCG that is being made from uh, the syncytiotrophoblast, if there is a pregnancy, is what's going to help maintain the corpus luteum. But we'll get to that when we get to pregnancy. So the main thing here to recognize is that FSH is going to have that initial um, rise in the early stages, the developing follicle. Um, and then you're going to get this estrogen peak, positive feedback switches. It goes from negative to positive feedback, which helps with this large LH surge. This LH surge is about the 14-day period, stimulates ovulation, the follicle ruptures, it's ready for, for possible fertilization. And then the corpus luteum is going to start making progesterone. Now we're in this luteal phase here. And then the progesterone is going to help maintain the endometrium for possible implantation. So that's the main parts. Again, Lindsay's going to go through it with you guys um, and um, go through the, the histology stuff that goes with it. So this kind of just breaks down what I was saying, right? So uh, originally this follicle stimulating hormone is going to uh, initiate the development of the follicle. This LH surge is super important to, uh, to the ovulation or the rupture of the follicle. And again, this brief positive feedback helps to trigger this surge of primarily uh, LH. Um, yeah, again, the LH surge, yeah causes the rupture and ovulation. Corpus luteum is gonna be what's making progesterone and we'll get into pregnancy with beta HCG in a second. Okay, and you can also see here that this corpus luteum is also gonna make inhibition, which will have a negative feedback system similar to uh, testosterone or the, or excuse me, the, the FSH stimulating inhibition in the male. So same principles here. Uh, this corpus luteum is most importantly going to be helping make progesterone, right? To keep the, uh, the endometrium prepared for possible implantation. Let's see. Okay, um, and then we can go into it. Uh, obviously during puberty, you're gonna get this uh, increase uh, in GNRH activity which from the hypothalamus, which will stimulate the anterior pituitary to start making FSH and LH. But which, what I wanted to point out, which is, uh, could be a test question. So one of the signs of men menopause, obviously you, you, you run out of ovaries. So you'll see this spike in FSH and LH, right? Because if you're not making, um, if you're not making uh, estrogen downstream, then you're not gonna have a negative feedback system. So some of the markers for menopause are uh, drastic rises in FSH and LH. And then you know this stuff, hot flashes, irritability, anxiety are, are uh, important components to menopause. Um, but one of the things, remember that uh, the osteoporosis is a sign, and that's because estrogen has an effect of inhibiting osteoclasts. I know this is like way back, we learned this, but uh, without the estrogen, those osteoclasts kind of run rampant and they could bite off uh, dip the calcium from the bone. So that's going to cause osteoporosis. So a lot of times women will get on estrogen supplementation, even, even post-menopause, uh, they'll get on back on birth control, you know, estrogen-derived birth control to help prevent the osteoporosis. Um, birth control, the primarily, if you can give a low dose of uh, progestins or uh, estrogen, you can help prevent that LH surge. So it's a constant low stream um, until, uh, until, uh, uh, until the, the female has, uh, has her period. Uh, then you, you, they obviously take sugar pills at that point. But um, you get this, for the three-week period, you get this low level of um, progestins or estrogen, estrogens, and that's going to prevent this LH surge. Uh, required for ovulation. Because remember, it, it's important that it's cyclical to, to work properly. Okay, um, early embryology. Um, nobody likes it. Well, I don't like this, but we'll go through the important points. Okay, remember for uh, the normal site, typically the ampulla of the fallopian tube is where fertilization happens. Um, they're both, both the sperm and the ovum are going to be haploid. 
but once they fuse together and they make the zygote, it's going to be diploid again, right? So you get one uh, sister chromatid to make uh, the chromosome together, one from 23 from mom, 23 from dad, making the 46 component. Okay. Uh, I, for some reason, I remember them asking about a marula, like what stage it was. So that just remember that's the 16 to 32 uh, stage. I just wanted to add that in there. Now, the important part about this implantation is that you start making the cytotrophoblast and syncytiotrophoblast. Cyto meaning cells, cytos, cytotrophoblasts are going to make cells. The syncytiotrophoblasts very importantly, are going to make beta HCG. So if there is implantation, cystiotrophoblasts are going to make beta HCG, and that's actually what the pregnancy test is. That urine pregnancy test can detect beta HCG in the urine, and that will indicate that the female is pregnant. So um, also importantly, the beta HCG will signal to the corpus luteum to not involute, to stay there because you want to continue the core, you want the corpus luteum to continue to secrete progesterone to keep uh, to keep the this layer of the endometrium viable okay so again the beta hcg is going to signal to the corpus luteum until the placenta is formed it's going to signal to the corpus luteum to continue to uh, progesterone and that is going to allow this endometrium to not um, uh, slough off during uh, menses okay so again, more of the same secrete syncytiotrophoblasts secrete uh, HCG. So that's going to be important. Ectopic pregnancies, we talk about this. Remember, this is right about the ampulla. This is where uh, the ectopic pregnancies typically happen. Uh, remember, uh, pelvic inflammatory disease is one of those things that's testable that can cause it. Uh, I, I think, oh, remember, oh, we'll get to that in a second. Never mind. Um, OK, let's talk about the fetus. So as you can imagine, the fetus flo floating in the amniotic fluid is more, it, it works as a shock, shock absorber, right? If you're, if you're in fluid, but importantly, it, it has a part in lung development. Remember when the, the child is swallowing fluid um, it, and kidney development as well. If the, if the child is swallowing fluid, uh, it allows the lungs to develop. And if, if the child is properly able to urinate the fluid back into the amniotic cavity, that helps with renal development as well. So any sort of deficiencies, uh, with, you know, whether it be uh, oligohydramnios or polyhydramnios can actually affect uh, the fetus. And you can see that here, this is from first aid. So it kind of talks about this, but one of the slides in your notes has it as well. So I'll talk about, here it is, put a star here. So remember, if you don't have enough fluid, the child can't swallow the fluid properly. So you can get lung hypoplasia. Uh, you can get limb deformities because if you have don't have enough fluid, the 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 um, the child can be have, um, you know mechanically uh, uh, restricted, so you can't get proper development. Uh, also, you'll see that oligohydramnios is related to renal agenesis. Why is that? Well, because if the child is able to swallow a lot of fluid but doesn't have the kidney or the renal system to excrete it a lot of the fluid will be in the child. So if you measure the, uh, the levels, it'll, it'll seem low, you'll get oligohydramnios. So keep in mind, oligos related to possible renal agenesis, but also can cause uh, lung hypoplasia. I don't know if the numbers are actually relevant. Maybe it would be good to just make sure you know about, uh, about that, um, what's considered uh, high and low. Okay, and then polyhydramnios, um, Complications, obviously, preterm labor is a big thing there. Now, why would why would why why would esophageal atresia cause polyhydramnios? Remember, esophageal atresia means that you can't properly swallow, right? There's atresia means a blind pouch. So, uh, if you cannot, if the child can't swallow the fluid, then it's going to build up in the amniotic cavity, right? Okay, I think that's all you really need to know about that. Oh, maybe this maternal diabetes is often a cause of polyhydramnios. Remember, maternal diabetes or gestational diabetes can often lead to macrosomia or a big baby. But I have a slide on that coming up. This is a mechanical problem. So sometimes this fibrous band from the amniotic band uh, can cause this, uh, this, uh, um, this stricture and it's gonna cause decreased blood flow and it'll cut off blood supply. And so you can see that here. So you can you get, um, 
uh, limb amputations here. So this is just a mechanical problem that can happen. They're cutting off blood supply. Okay, um, I think I just wanted to point out that the yolk sac, that does have different names, the vesicle, umbilical vesicle, the extra exosalomic cavity, but it's usually referred to as the yolk sac. It is the first site of uh, blood formation. So it goes from the yolk sac and then the liver starts making blood, eventually the bone marrow makes blood. So that's all I really wanted to point out here. Uh, the lantois is, um, it kind of, it, it's basically what ends up making the, the, um, the umbilical cord, right? So uh, once that obliterates, it'll make the uracus and then this median umbilical ligament, but the allantois is kind of allows those waste products uh, to go back from the baby into mom. And you can see here, I, I, I do remember them pointing out and important that the components of the second chorionic villus will be the, uh, will be the syncytiotrophoblast and cytotrophoblast, obviously. Uh, so that would be primary. Now the secondary, you're gonna add the extra embryonic mesoderm. So these three parts are gonna be secondary. Now the tertiary chorionic villi, that's when you're gonna add these fetal vessels. Okay, so keep that in mind. Secondary is gonna be these three. Tertiary is when you add the fetal vessels. It's more of the uh, mature form of it. This is what I wanted to bring up, this hyatiform mole. If for some reason the embryo dies or it doesn't complete development, you can see very high beta HCG levels, like fourfold, and that would be indicative that uh, the fetus did not survive. Now, when we talk about the placenta, some definitions you wanna be uh, aware of, the decidua basalis is the maternal component and the chorionic villi is the fetal component. Uh, that's the only part I wanted to really uh, talk about here. Okay, so again, as you know, the placenta mostly is about nutrition. The fetus does get, since it's not breathing, it does get its oxygenation from mom. So you get that there. Uh, and it also is able to secrete waste back through it. So mom can take care of it. Now, if you look here, this blue area, or actually it's this uh, light greenish area is, so it's gonna be like pools of mom's blood and this chorionic villi, those comes through, that's from the baby. So the blood can exchange in this area. So the deciduous here, um, and then the uh, chorion coming from the baby is up here. And then these are fetal vessels. So there's obviously exchange of uh, waste and gases here. And then this will go into fetal circulation. This is from first aid. It's kind of just a better diagram. So carbon dioxide, water, urea, waste, even hormones can go to and from. You can see the layer of the placenta, the cytotrophoblast and syncytiotrophoblast that are kind of penetrating into uh, the, uh, the placenta. And then uh, everything can go from mom circulation. IgGs, uh, antibodies, uh, those are importantly crossed over to the child uh, in fetal development. Okay, so let's break this down. The hemolytic, hemolytic diseases uh, are disease of newborns. So this is the scenario. Um, this RH factor this is, um, is just a, it, it's not super important except in this scenario. So like if you if if your blood if your blood if you're A positive that positive refers to this RH factor. Okay. Um, so let's say mom is RH negative, and she has a child. The fetus is RH positive. Now since their blood is going to mix at some point, the mother will develop antibodies because the the fetus is RH positive. The mother's RH negative in this scenario the mother's gonna develop antibodies to this RH factor, okay? So not a big deal in this first pregnancy, but now she's delivered that baby. Now mom has RH positive antibodies. Let's assume she has her second child is RH negative. Well, in this situation, those, those antibodies, wait, am I saying this right, RH negative? Yeah, these antibodies would, would uh, these RH positive antibodies, would attack the RH negative child, okay? So what they do actually, they just make sure they test the mom for it and they give what's called Rogan and it kind of counteracts it. But if for some reason, um, 
the, that the mother, uh, these antibodies are able to cross. Uh, this is called hemolytic disease of the newborn. It'll cause lysis of the cells. A more proper term is erythroblastosis fetalis. So um, it's really, I mean, it's just dealt with now. If you get, um, um, you know, a, a pregnancy workup, um, then they, they, they take care of all this. So um, it's relatively uncommon, at least in the States. Now, this is important that y'all, we did get a question about this. So knowing the difference, remember if the placenta is, um, is in the endometrium and it's uh, if some somehow um, it is uh, malformed or it's it's in a different location, it can cause problems. So placenta accreta, it goes into the myometrium. Okay, so it's going too far in. There she is. Lord have mercy. I'm glad I don't have to do histo. I was like, you better not. You better not. I was not going to leave you out in the dust, Brady. I oh, promise. now everybody wants to say hi. Okay. Turn your <laughs> cameras off. All right. I'm almost done, Lindsay. So, oh, and Aaron wants to say hi too. You found your sleeves, Aaron. I'm glad. All right. All right. <laughs> All right. So the placenta accreta is going to go into the myometrium. So after the, after birth, when you have to deliver the placenta, if it if it's into the myometrium, that could cause problems. It won't separate properly. And when it does separ separate, you can get a lot of uh, increased postpartum bleeding. Now, this is the accreta. So it's into the myometrium, myometing muscle, right? Now, if you get placenta per creta, that's further. It's going not only through the myometrium, but it's going all the way to the perimetrium. So that's even worse. So uh, think of percreta as a, a worse version of accreta. Now placenta previa, uh, that is where the placenta is covering the cervical eye. So the, I think of previa as, uh, as kind of like preview. So if you were the doctor and you were checking the cervix to see how dilated the patient is, you can't exactly preview the baby, right? Because the placenta is covering it. Okay, so obviously it's very difficult. Um, ideally, you wanna deliver the baby before the placenta, but in this situation, you might have to intervene. Okay, so keep these different definitions in mind. Um, as for twinning, dizygotic dies, twins are gonna be dichorionic, diamniotic. So dichorionic would imply uh, that they have their own um, placentas, right, separate. And this would imply that they came from two different zygotes diamnion, obviously they're in their uh, own amniotic sac. Monozygotic, those are gonna, so dizygotic is gonna be fraternal twins. Monozygotic twins are gonna be your identical twins. They, that implies they came from a single zygote. A lot of times, even though they're in the same amnion, let's see, um, even though they're in the same amniotic sac, they do have their own chorion, which means they have their own uh, separation of uh, the placenta. Uh, the placenta, yeah. There is mono-mono as well, monochorionic and monoamniotic. That's very rare. But just keep that in mind. I think any question they would ask would just differentiate it, differentiate if they came from two zygotes or a single zygote and what that would imply, right? So if single zygote means uh, this all happened early on, right, versus die, they're going to be separated. So keep that in mind. One thing um, a lot of times, or not a lot of times, but this, you, when you have twins, you can get this transfusion syndrome. For whatever reason, one of the twins will kind of uh, get more of the blood supply, more of the nutrients. Maybe the placenta is more uh, appropriately formed for one twin than the other. So you can see here, this twin kind of hogged a lot of the nutrients from this twin. So it's considered a, a, a transfusion syndrome. Um, Okay, somebody, I don't know, a long time ago, I put this in my drive because um, y'all were supposed to read about fetal monitoring. Somebody, I think a term above me, made slides based on that reading. So I went ahead and put this on my drive. It has everything you need. Okay, so I put the important stuff in the slides, but if you go to additional resources, instead of reading the fetal monitoring, y'all could just go through his like eight or so slides. But I put the important stuff here. So. Now, an amniocentesis basically means you're going to stick a needle into the amniotic sac, you're going to take out some of the amnion, amniotic fluid, and you're going to measure it. And you want to do that, you can't do this until about 15 weeks. But in, if you're not expecting any problems, that's fine. If for some, okay, so let me do this first. Alpha fetoprotein pro, alpha is going to be one of the major markers you're looking for. 
and this is why star here. Um, so if it's increased, you're you can you are considering an open neural tube defect. So like spina bifida, uh, uh, something like that. And it kind of it it helps me remember if the if the tube is open, it kind of it's like spilling alpha feta protein out. So that's why it's elevated. Now conversely, if you have a decreased alpha feta protein, that could be indicative of Down syndrome. Okay. Now, if for some reason there's a suspected problem, you can go in earlier than 15 weeks. I think CVS or chorionic village sampling is about, oh yeah, 12 weeks. So what they do here, this is a little bit more invasive, but you actually go directly into the placenta, the, the chorionic villi, and you could take blood from there. So if you need to do that, you can, uh, but, but ideally you wanna wait till about the 15 week mark, then you could just take it out the amniotic fluid. So um, it's much more less, it's less invasive that way. We talked about this. Remember that's with that row, um, that, that RH factor um, and erythroblastosis vitalis is basically hemolytic disease of the newborn. Um, this one's not super important, but for completeness sake, you can actually uh, take umbilical cord blood and you can do it that way as well. Fetal monitoring is just a normal thing um, for a pregnancy workup. Um, so you just, if nothing else, just to check the uh, fetal heart rate, make sure everything's fine. Um, but that's just a normal process. All right, let's go into pregnancy. We talked about much, much of this already. So HCG, that's the urine pregnancy test. Uh, it, it indicates that the, there has been implantation. Um, the, uh, the, the cytotrophoblast and cystiotrophoblast uh, have formed in the uterus with the fertilized egg and the cystiotrophoblasts are secreting HCG and that's what's measured. Remember HCG is what signals to the corpus luteum to stay around, continue secreting progesterone so that the endometrium uh, stays viable for that fertilized egg. Uh, all right, perfect. Um, so again, more of the same, HCG uh, is gonna support the corpus luteum, produces primarily progesterone. Now, this is the important part. The idea is that you wanna keep the corpus luteum around just long enough until you could form the placenta, right? So the, the syncytiotrophoblasts are going to secrete the beta HCG to tell the corpus luteum, continue to make progesterone, we have to make the placenta, about that uh, 12 week mark. This corpus luteum is not uh, used anymore. It can involute and the placenta takes over in making uh, the progesterone. Uh, this is from first aid. It's just a little bit of the same. You see this beta HCG, I think it peaks around day 13, uh, about the two week mark. And then you can see all the other hormones have just this um, uh, increase until pregnancy. This doesn't show actually at pregnancy because at pregnancy, Estrogen has a, a high jump and it's more than progesterone, but we'll talk about that in a second. So this is pretty self-explanatory. I, I did mention the IgGs are what passed. Those are long-term memory, uh, um, uh, long-term memory immunologic cells. Okay, so this is memory for mom saying uh, you need to be wary of sort of some sort of pathogens. IgMs are more of the short-term ones, so IgGs are the ones that cross. IgAs are what's in breast milk. Um, okay, good. So progesterone, um, not, not as important as uh, uh, estrogen is, uh, but um, it does have these, much of these are pretty self-explanatory. It does inhibit lactation during pregnancy, which is important. I think I have an overall slide coming up about it. And then estrogens are gonna initiate labor. There is that estrogen spike just prior to um, labor that helps with that. It will uh, also inhibit milk production, okay? HPL is um, not super important, but I just wanted to put it in here. It allows for more glucose availability for the fetus. That's primarily what you wanna um, be aware of. I, I put this here because there were, <clears throat> there were a lot of slides like this, but what I noticed is that all of the hormones, at least everything in the slide increases except FSH and LH. And you would expect FSH and LH to go down, right? So, um, and then the, the, these gonadotropes are gonna be unresponsive to, to GNRH. 
Okay. So if you just remember that the only things that go down are FSH and LH, you should be good. I put this in for completeness sake. You don't, by no means do you need to go through all of this, but if you're looking for some clarification here, these are all of the physiological changes that are related to pregnancy. Remember we mentioned that calcitonin isn't really used in adults. We primarily use PTH, but in the fetus, you need to take as much uh, calcium from mom as possible. So calcitonin is important uh, in bone formation for the fetus, right? You don't, you don't want PTH to act on the fetus and start pulling bone off, right? You want the calcitonin to say, no, we wanna form bone at all costs. So it's gonna, it's gonna prevent the PTH from forming, uh, from pulling the, the, the calcium off the bone. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Chilapilla, I think did this. Um, she, these were the two things she wanted to, uh, to be aware of. And you can notice here that the, the fetus actually does operate a lower O2 saturation. It can't speed up its metabolism. So you can see the differences between mom and the fetus. Remember that these are opposite, right? So the vein is oxygenated and the artery is deoxygenated. That's one of those rare occurrences. If we look here, remember that there's a left shift on the oxygen saturation curve, and that's because you have that fetal hemoglobin. So fetal hemoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen than normal hemoglobin. And that's important because it tells the fetus it can pull the oxygen from mom and it can use it, right? So that's why you get this left shift. Preeclampsia, uh, as far as I know, it, you, it's not exact. Uh, it, unless you had a previous pregnancy with preeclampsia, it's hard to know beforehand. Uh, I think the, the exact physiology behind it is unknown, but by all means, you need to know that these are the two, two major components of it, hypertension and proteinuria. I imagine they do get edema as well, but if they have a patient that comes in with hypertension and proteinuria, uh, you can get preeclampsia. You can diagnose preeclampsia. So anything systolic over 140 and uh, a lot of protein in the urine. Eclampsia is the, this is why you wanna treat preeclampsia as soon as possible because you don't want it to develop to eclampsia. Uh, this could be very dangerous for mom and for baby. Gestational diabetes. This typically resolves after pregnancy, but what you'll see is during pregnancy, uh, the mom develops diabetes and these children end up with macrosomia. So you get a really big baby uh, just because of all of the extra glucose. Mom, de mom develops insulin resistance, right? So the, her, insulin, her glucose is through the roof. That means baby's glucose is through the roof. That means the baby grows. All right, some of the, the brief things, I'll, I'll point out what I think is important. So you get this CRH spike uh, remember CRH, corticotropin releasing hormones from the hypothalamus. I usually it would stimulate ACTH to cortisol, but in this situation, it's going to help stimulate DHEAS, right? Um, you can look up that long word. I just know it like this. So what this is going to do is very importantly cause a drastic spike in estrogen. During labor, you want to have a higher estrogen to progesterone ratio. So you, that's the point here. Um, now during, for contractility, uh, a lot of when the uterus stretches, it's gonna cause this mechanical uh, contraction. But as you know now, oxytocin is going to help with contraction as well. But uh, also um, primarily these estrogens, this estrogen spike that from the DHEAS uh, is gonna cause uh, this, this uh, oxytocin release, it's gonna help with the oxytocin release and it's gonna help with uh, um, labor contractions. Again, as I mentioned, the, the uterine changes, this uh, the smooth mus muscle response to the stretch is gonna help with contraction and then also oxytocin, the, the hormone release is gonna help with contraction. I mentioned this already, you get a higher estrogen to progesterone ratio the estrogen is gonna help with contraction, help with oxytocin release. Oxytocin is gonna help deliver the baby and help with the postpartum bleeding as well. So we kind of talked about this. Uh, breast development, uh, estrogen's the major promoter. Progesterone comes in later on and helps with the secretion or the ability to secrete milk. So we talked about this already. Dopamine has an inhibitory effect on prolactin. But if you see here, 
the mechanical act of suckling will help with dopamine inhibition. Uh, prolactin releasing factor is TRH, uh, thyroid releasing hormone, same thing, they're interchangeable, and that will help with prolactin secretion. Now you'll be able to get milk production. Remember, increased levels of estrogen and progesterone is going to uh, inhibit milk production so that decrease after labor of that drastic decrease of estrogen and progesterone uh, will help with milk production. So they kind of work interchangeably. Prolactin. Now, initially, uh, uh, just after labor, um, the, fem the, the mother cycles will still be delayed because it's, uh, the prolactin will help to decrease GnRH secretion. So I, I guess a few months is a few, I think a few months later, uh, her cycles uh, start back up again, but initially this prolactin will help um, to uh, inhibit the GnRH secretion. And then lastly, uh, again, same thing, the suckling, the mechanical receptors of the hypothalamus will kind of stimulate oxytocin release and that will help with the milk ejection. Same thing here. I just wanna make another point. The clostrum is super important. That first 24 to 48 hours, the milk that's produced has a lot of antibodies. As I mentioned, IgAs are in there. So that's why it's really important to breastfeed the first few days because um, this clostrum is gonna be important to have a lot of the factors from mom to get to baby. And that's all for me. So Lindsay's gonna take over. Do you want me just psych, just a click through for you? Yeah, sure. Okay. Or do you guys want a break or are we good? Yeah, do y'all want a break? Yes. <laughs> yes. So five minute break, I guess. Okay, that's fine. Brady, can I ask a quick question? Um, I just have a question about birth control. So I'm a little confused on how it works. Like it just has to be a certain level because I know estrogen causes the LH surge, but it's because it's a lot of estrogen. But right, I think now, now granted, there's a, there's a ton of different methods, but I'm, it's my understanding that you're, you're giving a constant low level of either estrogen or progesterone. And by doing that, you're preventing that cyclical change, those huge jumps in estrogen and whatnot. So by doing that, you never get the LH surge, so you, so you don't have ovulation. Got you. Thank you so much. Okay, are we ready to start Beloved Histo? Okay, I'm taking silence as um, complacency. <laughs> no, nobody likes Histo, but, um, but I'm gonna go through kind of how I went about doing and studying this histo. So for the male, I just focused a lot on mapping out the characteristics in the different areas along the path of the spermatozoa. So you start in the seminiferous tubules and the, um, the I actually um, updated the ER review that I have in my Google Drive because I took I spent a long time last term when I was studying mapping this out. And so I literally just, I updated it um, with some more things and I just um, copied and pasted it on here. So you'll see all my markings that I put on my slides, but so you start in the seminiferous tubules, the big thing you are going to need to differentiate between the, uh, the straight tubules and the REIT testes. So you have the seminiferous tubules, that is kind of the convoluted part of the testes. It goes into the straight tubules and the straight tubules are going to empty into the REIT testes right here. And so make sure that you can differentiate between these two. There's not, um, I don't think there's a lot of intricacy that goes in right here. Ooh, you are not cooperating with me now. <laughs> and then- can you, can, you, can you make your screen, can you make it full screen? Is there a way to do that in the PDF? Click that, click that right there, that, yeah. Uh-oh, I'll click, maybe full, full screen your, your browser. Why is it coming up like this? There you go. And then you can make, yeah, cool.
Okay, cool. Come on, cooperate with me. There we go. So you need to be able to tell the difference between the two. And you also want to know what kind of epithelium are in each area. So you go from the seminiferous tubules, you go to the efferent ducts. The big thing about the efferent ducts, it's this saw-like texture right here. And so if you see this, you automatically know this is efferent ducts. So that's the big differentiator right here. And then you go to the epididymis. This is a picture that they like to use. So you're getting more columnar here. This is ciliated columnar. So make sure you know, again, what epithelium it is. So that's the biggest thing from the um, testes to here is just what type of epithelium and what kind of cells. That's honestly the biggest thing here in just differentiating. So now Lindsay, we have- Lindsay, can I just add, can you go back to that slide? Cause I remember something that really helped me out. If you see the epididymis, if you notice that the lumen is com like, it's it's uh it, it, on the on the right picture, it's it's completely it's like continuous, right? It makes like a complete circle. It's not jagged, so that's uh that's indicative that lumen right there is indicative of the epididymis. And the vas deferens, there is a clinical correlate with the vas deferens, which is really important because it runs very superficially. And so that means it's very accessible for a vasectomy. That's why they um, ligate the vas deferens. So that means the sperm are then prevented from traveling further than the proximal ductus deferens. Um, complication, of course, you can um, still get that sperm production leading to distension of the area because it can't go anywhere because of the ligation and then you get granulomas. Seminal vesicles, the big thing here, um, I couldn't find it in your histo slides, but you need to be able to differentiate these areas on an imaging study. So um, I'm pretty like a uretogram, I believe. But you need to be able to know the ampulla versus the seminal vesicles. And that is, um, it can be easy points if you look over that. With the urethra, you need to need to need to know the different parts of it. And you will probably be given a, um, an imaging study with an arrow pointing somewhere and the clinical vignette will ask you to say, which part of the urethra are we talking about? I would um, posit that they are going to focus more on the membranous and prostatic because these are very close to one another. And depending on what image they use, it can be a really good way of differentiating if you know where you are versus the penile urethra, which is pretty easy to tell where you are. So I think they would focus more on here, but of course, you know, you need to be able to differentiate each area on an imaging study. Um, but, you know, know what type it, of epithelium is there. So prostatic is transitional, which makes sense because it's in a, um, a variable area near the bladder. So just think about that with the close proximity to the bladder, it has the transitional epithelium. Membranous is stratified or pseudostratified columnar, and then you get, um, and then pseudostratified columnar going down. Um, you do need to know that the penile urethra is called the spongy urethra. They would probably use spongy over penile urethra, um, but know that. And then it is important that you can differentiate the different tissues in uh, the near the penile urethra in the penis. So the uh, spongiosum and cavernosum, if they point to an area, they may not tell you in the vignette and explicitly say, this is this, this is this, but they might give you like a presentation and talk about like impotence or something like that. And they might could have put a star somewhere and say, okay, which area would you likely see um, be affected. And so make sure, like, do it clinically. Um, this picture is a really good one right here because you can kind of see the differences. And picture again down here. Um, I will talk about this when we get to the testes, but you do need to know the different layers. So the tunica albiginia, we'll talk about that again in a minute. But 
again, this is just highlighting the spongiosum versus cavernosum. So that's going to be really important at this part of the histology is do you know which section is which? Okay, the testes. I put this picture on here because I want you guys to see the difference in the layers. That could be really important in a question stem. So remember, as the testes descend down, they're going to do so with the process vaginalis. So they ev evaginate through the processes vaginalis, it obliterates and it's gonna form the tunica vaginalis, which is the outermost layer of the testes. So in my picture, I highlighted it right here. And then of course you have the tunica albuginea. So make sure that you can differentiate the layers in the testes right here. That could be um, either a hard question or an easy question if you spend a minute or so on this, um, knowing the different areas. I have a question on mm -hmm. tunica vaginalis. Is that before the tunica abugana? Like, is that the layer on the outside? They kind of look close together. Yeah, they're very close together. So the outermost layer is going to be the tunica vaginalis. And if you if you zoom in, I'm not going to try to because my computer freaked out last time I tried to zoom in for you guys. Um, the tunica vaginalis is actually this arrow is pointing to the outermost layer and tunica albuginea is a, a little more towards the more eosinophilic area, the more seed area. Yeah, but you do need to know those layers. You need to know what is the outermost layer. And then, of course, you are going to need to be able to distinguish um, the Sertoli and the Leydig cells. I think there will be about two or three questions, but of course, the Leydig cells, the interstitial cells, that should be an easy point for you guys. And then if you go to um, the actual seminiferous tubules, you can see the differentiation in the maturation of the spermatozoa. So I would spend some time um, just knowing a about where each of them are so that if they put a star next to a certain cell in its maturation, you can know based off of where it is, what stage it should be. So it's, it's gonna be pretty obvious, I believe, which one. So I, I just wanna add, like we def, we had multiple questions on this, like this bottom right picture Mm -hmm. They asked us specifically what, which cell type was which. Like we had to identify like what is the spermative and also the top right picture. This came back cumul cumulatively as well. Yes. They were pointing to the Leydig cells and they were asking what hormone specifically responded to it. So they use histo to ask that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to back up what Brady just said. This top right picture, I'm pretty sure it came back on multiple cumulative exam or came back in a cumulative way on multiple exams. So, um, hey, Lindsay, I have a quick question. So, um, yeah, on this page at the bottom left, the one that like you're supposed to label. So, mm -hmm. I was going to label it on my own, and then I was having trouble between um, C and D. Or, or you see, could you just uh, tell us what C is? C? Yeah. Like, what do you think, Brady? That's towards the end of maturation, right before it gains its tail. This is spermatid. I agree with spermatid. It's still rounded, yeah. So generally you go from out to in, right? So, yeah. but if it's still rounded, it should still be a spermatid. Once it goes oblong or oval, then it's the spermatogoan. Thank you. And we have confirmation the histo book says spermatid. So good, thanks, Sean. Now we get to accessory glands. Um, with accessory glands, you do need to know how to differentiate, but also make sure that you understand what it contributes to semen. And so the seminal vesicles, this is the bulk of the semen, but it's an alkaline fluid. So you have fructose for ATP, and then you have the PGEs. Now, if you look at this, this can be easy to identify. It's a very tumultuous, torturous um, lumen. So that can kind of tell you, oh, I'm in the seminal vesicle area. But remember, they... Um, 
I remember um, something being very high yield are the imaging studies where you have to be able to know the difference between the seminal vesicle, the ampulla, and then the structures coming in and going out. So that's going to be very, very high yield for you. And then the prostate, um, so citric acid, PSA, I would know all of these things. Now I put this little um, cartoon on here because this showed up for us and I was not expecting it to show up for us. So please do not overlook this little cartoon. Like, I don't know about you guys, when I, when I go through the slides, I usually focus more on, um, in the histo slides, I focus more on the histo and the imaging studies and I'll glance over the cartoons, but I won't really spend a whole lot of time on the cartoons. Make sure you spend some time on this cartoon in case this shows up for you. But the biggest thing with the prostate, of course, are going to be the zones that can relate to pathology. So BPH and um, cancer are going to have different areas. So BPH is gonna be transitional zone, cancer is gonna be the more peripheral zone. And histologically, how do you differentiate? It's these concretions, that's the biggest thing. Cause this kind of looks like what it did with the um, seminal vesicle. But if you see these concretions, you know you are in the area of the prostate. That's the biggest thing that you can use to differentiate histologically where you are um, in that path of the semen. Okay, so that was um, that was male histo. Anything we want to talk about before we move on to female histo? Okay. So I put this on here just for completeness sake. Let me check the chat real quick. So what's outside of the tunica vaginalis? So is it Darto's fascia? I mean, that's the vaginalis is the outermost layer. I think maybe Darto's fascia wraps around it, but other than that, you're pretty much on the outside. Yeah. Um, I put this slide up here kind of for complete. Com Holy. You guys hear him growling back here? He's being moody. Um, it's because you're doing female histo, that's why. Yeah, apparently he's not happy. <laughs> I put this on here for completion sake. I wouldn't think that they would get this um, zoomed out for you guys, but the biggest thing with female histo, and I think a lot of people have some issues with this, is differentiating between the different follicles. Stop it, or I'm going to put you in your kennel. I let him out so he could be with me, and then he's being moody. Okay. Sorry guys, okay. Primordial follicle. This contains the primary oocyte that, ooh, okay, no, come on. Are you guys seeing this again? Okay. Yes. Yeah. The videos keep getting in my way, so I keep trying to move it. Okay, this contains the primary oocyte arrested in prophase one. This is very important that it's arrested in prophase one. So you are going to notice these are very numerous. It's just below the tunica albuginea and surrounded by a single layer, layer of squamous follicular cells. You need to chill. So these, you can see the single layer of the follicular cells and they're very numerous in number. So there's not a whole lot going on with these. The biggest things about the primary oocyte is going to be that it's arrested in prophase one. So this is the biggest high yield point there. Now, moving on to the early primordial follicle. Now, the biggest way is to see what is added to the area when you keep going. So this is, again, primary oocyte arrested in prophase one, but the follicular cells become more cuboidal. So if you see here, they were very obviously squamous. Now they're getting to be a little more cuboidal and the oocyte starts to secrete the zona pellucida. So you can see this right on the edge here. So it's a little more formed, but still we don't have, um, there are some defining characteristics later on here. Now, a late 
primary follicle still with the primary oocyte arrested in prophase one. Now we have, you see more cuboidal cells coming over here. And the biggest thing that you can differentiate late primary, primary follicle and anything later is you don't see these antral spaces. And so that's gonna be an indicator that you're moving forward. So remember, just the simple squamous, you're getting more cuboidal and you're adding the cuboidal cells. Now, secondary follicles, this is where you start to see the antral spaces, but notice the antral spaces are pretty small. They're not substantial. They're just, a, you know, a little space around that oocyte. It's not very big. And so still, again, primary oocyte, you get the antral spaces. Sometimes multiple can appear, but it's not going to be substantial area within this follicle. Um, so you do need to know, you know, oocyte maturation and inhibition, granulosa cells begin to organize in two layers. So you have the fecal layer and you have the basal lamina. So the biggest thing to differentiate, of course, is the introduction of those antral spaces. Now, I think that picture was on our test, just to throw that out yeah. there. I think one of those was on there. Now, once you get to the graphene follicle, you have a much more defined and larger antral space, and it's actually taking up the majority of the follicle here. And you can see this oocyte is kind of now being pushed towards the periphery right here. So rapid increase in size, you know if it's taking up a lot of it, you, you're seeing this graphene follicle. Um, cumulus ophorus. This might have been a question. I think I spent a, a while trying to understand what this was. Um, so maybe make sure you know that. Corona radiata, so these are the cells immediately lining the oocyte. So the oocyte right here, it's, they're immediately lining microvilli that communicate um, via gap junctions. And then ovulation, I wouldn't, I don't think this was on our, um, test. I just thought this was a cool picture to like actual, actual, you know, the ovulation, you can see it. Um, but so primary oocyte undergoes meiosis one. This is super, 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 super high yield because up until this point, the we've been arrested in prophase one. So now it finishes meiosis one and becomes a secondary oocyte and it's released from the graphene follicle. So now it's arrested in metaphase two. So this slide right here is very high yield, very, very, very high yield. Um, so question, so is it, uh, uh, what is it? Is it like uh, oocyte two and graphene or after? Because it has to finish like the, uh, the meiosis one and start meiosis two, right? So does it start it before ovulation I know, like, yeah, it is before ovulation, but is it in the graphene or after? It's in, so it's kind of at the same time. Ovulation is when it finishes meiosis one. So all women have their oocytes already upon birth. And in the, in the early primary follicle, they're all arrested in prophase one. And, um, when you, according to the um, cycle of the hormones, you're going to get multiple primary follicles that actually develop, but you only have one event of ovulation. And this is at the point of the LH surge. So if you line this up with the graph, this is at the LH surge, you get the ovulation. And so it triggers this primary oocyte that has been arrested in prophase one. Remember prophase is at the very, very, very beginning of meiosis. Like you barely started meiosis like nothing's really happening yeah. but you get, you get the lh surge you get the ovulation and then you finish meiosis one you get arrested in metaphase two um because this isn't actually going to continue until you uh ovulation. yeah exactly but my question is if they ask like what this uh, follicle and what type of cell we're gonna say it is primary or site in the graph yeah. cell, but after like like what picture they're gonna give, what follicle? So we can say this is now, it's a primary, secondary oocyte. So are they gonna give the you, one? 
No, I, I don't think you would because the the primary oocytes are the ones that are going to be housed within the follicle. Once it's released from the follicle after ovulation, that's a secondary. Uh, uh, yeah, and but at that point, it's now traveling down the fallopian tube. And so I don't think it, they would show that after that point. The biggest thing is the maturation of the follicle prior to ovulation and at the point of ovulation and what that means for its um, stages of meiosis. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Lindsay, so, just to, sorry to interrupt, but just um, for some clarification, they asked us a clicker question during this lecture. If you go up one slide about um, collecting secondary oocytes and the answer was actually the tertiary um, graphene follicle. It was the image on the left. They asked okay. us where they would find the secondary oocyte. Yeah, that's why I asked. Oh, yeah. okay. So, yeah, the correct answer was the bottom. So it's secondary, question. right? So should we choose secondary, not primary? Well, they didn't, I don't think they gave us the option for the ovulation image. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe if we had to choose between the two, I would say that ovulation would be the better answer, but. They asked where to harvest a secondary oocyte from, and this is the only stage before it ruptures where you would see a secondary oocyte. So like the graphene follicle is the only place where you would see a secondary oocyte while it's still maturing in the ovary. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, I don't think I was understanding the clicker question. But yeah, if you wanted to harvest it, because of course, um, for fertility reasons, you want to you want to be able to harvest eggs. So, um, and this is just me thinking right now, please do not take this as any sort of concrete data, but um, that's why you give hormones to women who are trying to harvest eggs for either IVF or other um, fertility purposes. And so you can get, because remember, all of this is stimulated by the up and down of the hormones. And so you're trying to stimulate the maturation of the follicles and of the oocytes. And so that is why you want to get it here, because this is your best chance to get those um, most mature oocytes. But that would be my thinking in that. That's why it would be applicable if you want to take it clinically. But you want to go on? Okay, so like I said, multiple primordial follicles are going to develop each cycle. But remember, we only get one um, cycle of, you only get one ovulatory event. And so the ones that don't make it to ovulation, they are atretic follicles. So these don't release an oocyte. That's what they are. So these are, they, they look like lobules almost. If you see it here, if you can, you know, want to relate it back to previous histological things that you've seen, they kind of look like lobules. A corpus luteum, this is the one that is going to secrete the hormones. This is after ovulation. So it's going to inhibit FSH and LH. So the granulosa lutein, this is going to secrete estrogen, progesterone and inhibin, and then the theca lutein, progesterone and androgens. Okay, uterine tube. You do need to be able to look at these and say where you are with relation to the actual ovary and the uterus. So it's going to be, um, you know, more tissue. Do y'all know which is which? I can't see the chat because I don't have my external monitors. Yeah. So the way I remember it is that the intramural one is really close to the fundus of the uterus. And so that would have more of the muscle, um, mm -hmm. more of the smooth muscle. So that's the lead, the last portion of it. Um, yeah. I also look at like the, how big the, 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 the spherical hole is getting. So, um, as it's getting smaller and smaller, you're getting narrower and narrower. Yeah. Um, and so the one on the top there, that's the isthmus. Um, and you can see some of the smooth muscle appearing, um, and uh, yeah, that's just how I see it. Yeah, exactly. So you're gonna have more smooth muscle closer to the actual ovary. And then as you get to the uterus, you have less and less smooth muscle and you can see the lumen area is going to be more. So ciliated columnar, why is it ciliated? 
you can answer. So wow, yeah, yeah. No, sorry. Yeah. So I mean, that's why it's motility. So carrying the oocyte along, and then peg cells are going to in um, under the control of progesterone. I would know this, and then responsible for secreting nutrient nutritive material for the ovum. Um, and of course, it makes sense that as you get closer to the uterus, peg cells will increase because you, because once you get closer to the uterus, that's where you are going to expect ovulation. Now this is throwback to FTM1. Where are you going to expect fertilization to occur? Ampula. Ampula. Mm -hmm. In the ampulla. So that makes sense that you get less cilia because you want to keep it there. You don't want motility. You want to keep it there and you want to new, um, provide a lot of nutrients so that it stays for as long as possible and is as um, nurtured as possible so it can get fertilized. Um, uterus, the biggest thing here are going to be the layers of stratum basale is retained at SP status post. So after menses, so this doesn't, this is not the layer that sheds the stratum functionality is the layer that is shed during menses, menses being the actual menstruation um, process, releasing blood. And then this thickens under the control of estrogen. This is really important. Um, so proliferative early secretory, this is the sawtooth. So you do need to be able to differentiate these. You need to know which is going to be, I'm pretty sure they had a late um, phase on here right before menstruation. So you see this on the bottom right picture, it's very evident you have this sawtooth appearance. Hey, Lindsay. Didn't mm -hmm. they have a question that, didn't they have a question that says like after the endometrium sloughs off, like what part stays like the spiral yeah. artery or something yeah. like that? Yeah, spiral artery. That is very oh, yeah. high that the spiral artery stays. And it, that reminded me earlier, I wanted to ask you before you got on, um, remember that question about the dorsal penile artery? Yes, I do. Because what was the, do you, what was, I got, yeah, we talked about this. What was, do you remember the question? Because I thought, it had to do with an erection. And when I was reading it, I thought I was going to have to answer like the helicine arteries or it was the cavernous nerve or something along that lines. It, oh, it was drain. Oh, I don't even remember. Drainage? I don't remember. Yeah, something like that. I would know that. But, yeah, so no, you're right, Sean. The spiral artery is broken down. I think it's that straight artery um, that, that stays. Yeah, so the, because the spiral artery is what's developed in the endometrium. Yeah, um, but yeah, just brush up on your dorsal artery. I think it does say it's like the main uh, drainage pathway from uh, for, for the penis. And I think the only reason I got it right was because I drew it out and the other ones just didn't make sense with respect to my drawing. So it was more of a process of elimination. Like none of the others make sense here. And that's the only reason I got it right. It wasn't like I actually knew it. <laughs> But that happens a lot. Um, process of elim elimination is your best friend. Okay, but you do need to be able to differentiate between these. It's an easy point if you know it. Um, and then myometrium, you know, myo muscle. So hyperplasia during pregnancy due to increase in collagen fibers and the in influence of progesterone. Progesterone is just the hormone of pregnancy. So anything that is going to set the uterus up for um, keeping a baby inside is going to be progesterone and then contract in the, under the influence of oxytocin at parturition. Um, but oxytocin is, so we talked earlier about what is going to be the actual switch for partuition, and it is that ratio of progesterone to estrogen. That is the big thing because progesterone keeps you pregnant, whereas estrogen is the opposite. So it switches, but then you have all of these things, for example, the head of the baby pushing against the cervix that is going to stimulate oxytocin. And then oxytocin is going to cause the myometrium contraction. And so you have that switch and then you get the oxytocin. Um, Placenta, um, I don't remember this being a big thing histologically, but you should know what it secretes. Anytime an area does talk about something that it secretes or contributes to the overall process, that is very high yield. Um, 
Chorion to divide from trophoblast, extra embryonic mesenchyme. I just wrote all this down here. We talked about how maternal is decidua basalis. That's very high yield. I would know this. Um, is this the is this the module where I forget who it was, but at the beginning of the endo lecture, he drew out the whole thing and like it was like the yeah. entire yeah yeah, yeah. I remember the entire lecture in one drawing. It was awesome. <laughs> I forget his name, but yeah, one of the anatomy guys, yeah. Yeah. I watched that part of the lecture like five times and drew it out to understand what was going on here. <laughs> um, with the cervix, you will be asked to differentiate the regions of the cervix. Um, so the big thing here is the transformation zone and can you spot the differences? So the endocervix versus the ectocervix. Um, and then, of course, anytime there is an area of transition, they love to throw in metaplasia in there. So that could be a high yield thing that could, you could easily get right. Um, uh, yeah, make sure that you look over that. And remember, the thing about metaplasia versus dysplasia is metaplasia is reversible. You mm -hmm. just have to stop the insult, right? And then it can convert back. Once it's dysplastic, then it's really problematic and you can't yeah. convert it back. Yeah, dysplastic leads to malignancy. And then the vagina, non-characterized stratified squamous. I feel like this was a big thing. And or maybe it was just a clicker question in a lecture and the joke was like keratinized versus non-keratinized because some people put keratinized and it was like, why would you want keratinized? squamous epithelium in your vagina, I don't know. But um, I don't know if this was a thing, but I remember spending some time on this to understand what this was. So glycogen is stored in the cells and it's released when they're desquamated. Um, and so you have lactobacillus in the vaginal vault and that is commensal bacteria. It's part of your normal flora and it actually helps protect you. That's why women get yeast infections when you take antibiotics because it destroys the normal flora. And then anything in there takes that opportunity. It's like, oh, okay, we can grow and divide and be mean. So that's um, a big thing there. Or maybe that was a question. I don't remember, but I, I do remember sitting down and I'm trying to understand that really well. The breast, you will have one or two questions distinguishing um, the different um, inactive versus active and lactating. So inactive, you are going to notice there's a large portion of stroma versus the glands. And so you, I mean, dense connective tissue, you see all of this here. This might've also been a thing that it's dense connective tissue um like yeah, regular that, that was on the test that picture was yeah because this is dense inactive. Regular yeah. connective tissue i'm pretty sure that was a big thing but this is inactive um versus active so on the left we have a proliferative phase this is right before um parturition this is right before labor and delivery and then um on the right this is in a lactating breast. And so you do need to be able to distinguish these. Um, you will have a question or two on your exam about this. Prepubescent. Yeah, you could say prepubescent, but if you notice in the active, um, it, it shows um, late pregnancy and lactating. And so um, I don't know what it, it, I don't know if it returns to inactive afterwards. The, the term inactive does imply that in any non-lactating breast, this is what you would see because again, prolactin, remember, is going to um, initiate the development of all of the structures within the breast that are going to allow for um, milk production and lactation and everything. So I would assume that once prolactin is no longer acting on the breast tissue, you would not see as much um, as developed ducts and glands as you would in an active acinus. Um, I had a question. So 
The way it was communicated to me is that the histo slides are commonly taken from what they give you in lecture, although the point of it would be using the tools you are given to be able to um, recognize it on any histological side slide they presented, but in our experience, um, a lot of them are going to come from what they give you. Yeah, same picks for sure. They're the yeah. same exact ones. Yeah. Um. Okay, so inactive. Oh, so the the connective tissue is just it's with response to the type of tissue in the breast. It doesn't really, it's not gonna differ between like active and inactive. It's just the type of tissue there, the connective tissue. But so, sorry, there's a question. Yeah, so estrogen is gonna be the primary player during pregnancy that helps with the, um, with the development of the breast and then uh, progesterone comes in after and kind of like fine tunes the ducts and stuff like that. And then prolactin will help with the milk production. Oxytocin oh, helps yeah. with the milk letdown. So yeah, if they ask about the development during the pregnancy cycle, I would go with estrogen for sure. Yes, yes, sorry guys. Remember whenever, when you're talking about um, physiology of pregnancy, the female physiology, it all has to do with the ratio of the hormones at a point in time. That's what's going to signal different events. And so you really need to draw out that graph and then look at the histo, um, particularly the female histo, because it's so closely related and say, okay, this is happening because this hormone ratio switched or like the LH surge or something like that. Like they can incorporate all of those topics into one question, you know, asking you one thing. So make sure um, that was probably the toughest thing for me on this exam was the repro physiology and with respect to the um, changing of certain ratios and then the pregnancy stuff. For some reason, I like the hormone changes in pregnancy. I just, I just wasn't good at that. <laughs> so if, if that's you, I would spend a little more time on it. I think I saw a question in the chat on the Tanner's developmental stages um, about how high yield that was. I don't, I don't even think, no, I don't think it was tested to be honest. The what? The tan of the breast development and secondary sexual characteristics, the tan oh, stages. Oh. It, it it's in first aid if you want to look at it briefly. It's like on one page in first aid, but I don't I don't remember it being tested. I would know what hormones are going to facilitate what secondary sexual characteristics and what they are. I think I remember that. Do you guys have any more questions? Hey, Lindsay. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to know if you could go back to the last page and just try and um, differentiate these two for me because they look very pretty similar and I don't see any difference. Apart from the connective tissue that doesn't really look like connective tissue on the right, but uh, if I didn't have that, I can't see it. I don't know if you would have to differentiate these two side by side, honestly. Brady, picture, do you have the, I don't know, but the, I, all I remember is the picture we had was the inactive, uh, the non-lactating breast. But between these two pictures, yeah, like I, I see what you're saying. Like if you only if they only gave you one, like how would you be able to differentiate? Um, well, because the one on the left is a higher magnification than the one on the right. It looks like. I seriously doubt they would they would ask you to differentiate yeah. the two. All right, thank you guys. No worries. We love y'all too. <laughs> All right, I'll go ahead and stop the recording then.